Uh, your second book, Thomas, was called The Nordic Secret. Uh, let's just start with what what is The Nordic Secret? Okay, so I should first of all uh, mention that I've written the book uh, together with uh, Lynn Rachel Anderson, my, my Danish uh, friend and colleague. She She's a philosopher and, and author, and she really uh, did the the most heavy work on on that book so full credit to lena on the nordic secret um what we do in that book is that we uh, unpack a very important part of uh the history of the nordic countries and the fact that we just a little bit more than a hundred years ago all the nordic countries at the end of the 1800s were amongst the poorest non-democratic uh, authoritarian uh, uh, nations in Europe. We were so poor that at the end of the 1800s, up to 30% of the working population in Sweden uh, emigrated, uh, mainly to the to the U to the US. And then just a few generations later, even before the Second World War, we were all amongst the happiest, the richest, the most stable industrial democracies in the world. And many of those benefits are still amongst us. We are starting to lose a little bit of this, but uh, the fact that we managed the transition from a pre-modern society into a modern society um, so well um, is worth investigating. Because I think that we, uh, as a civilization, are now at a similar transition from uh, modernity into some sort of new society. So what can we learn? And the learning and the secret around this is that we had some very visionary intellectuals and politicians in all the Nordic countries a hundred years ago who knew the importance of uh, inner development and inner growth. And the, specifically the connection between inner growth and cultural evolution and, and societal evolutions. And they knew that in times of rapid societal change and uncertainty, it's just so easy for us humans to want to have an external authority to hold on to uh, a dogmatic religion or a strong authoritarian political leader. Um, but these intellectuals and, and uh, politicians, they didn't want to be authoritarian leaders. They were firmly committed to build democracy and they knew that the only way to build democracy and be and keep democracy is if you build it from bottom up. So they wanted to find a way where they could uh, facilitate the inner development of capacities in a large scale, a large part of the population on a large scale and specifically help in this very important adult development step where we go from being, again, dependent on an external authority, being outer directed to become inner directed, to connect with our own inner compass and be able to, in a much, much more profound way, hold the complexity of rapid social change without freaking out. This was uh, 100 way, years ago? This was 100 or even a bit more, 100 to 150 years ago. This was at the end of the 1800s. And the way they went about to do this was extraordinary because what they did was that they created uh, educational centers or even we might use the word retreat centers because these were small centers out in nature uh, specifically uh, uh, dedicated to helping young adults in their 20s to take these important developmental steps. Uh, and when this program, uh, so I should say, sorry, at the turn of the last century, year 1900, there were a hundred centers like this just in Denmark, 75 in Norway, and 150 in Sweden, where young adults later on with full state subsidy could spend up to six months in retreat uh, with a specific aim of trying to develop their emotional and cognitive complexity and becoming agents, becoming conscious agents and co-creators of the new society. What, did those exist in France and Germany and the United no, States no, at that time? No. Well, uh, um, 
as far as I, I have not as such. No, 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 uh, I, I'm not, not in France. Uh, the, this originally came from a, a German idea about uh, how we as humans have the capacity, lifelong capacity, to, com to continue develop our inner capacities, our emotional and cognitive capacities. That was from the German Bildung philosophers, philosophers like Schiller, Goethe, Herder, uh, von Humboldt, Hegel, who and, all and this is where the this is where the market comes in again. Is if we quantify all the things that our ancestors valued, we're parsing it into a dollar, and the dollar doesn't reward some of the things that you just said. So it's almost as if Scandinavia already had a people, planets, profit hierarchy a hundred years ago. It was just. You know. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. V very much because we back then German was our first academic language, so uh, our intellectuals back then were actually reading these German philosophers in uh, in original German language. And of course, as I was about to say, they all reacted against the Enlightenment's materialistic view and the view of our mind as a rational machine. They were very much into nature, the relationship between humans and nature, the, the relationship between our inner capacity to develop our mind and consciousness and how that inner development was always done in in um, relationship to culture and cultural development. So with that view that it is important to facilitate lifelong inner development, not just for the benefit of the individual, but for the benefit of societal development, then of course these ideas come very natural. But when we then later on lost that worldview, and definitely after the Second World War, if not a bit earlier, reverted to the Enlightenment materialistic worldview, then these centers as inner capacity building centers or consciousness development centers didn't even make sense to us uh, in our understanding. So today we believe that these centers were mainly adult education, which there were to a certain extent, absolutely. But the important reason for their establishment was really to to empower people to take these important developmental steps to be able to not just have the knowledge, but to have the inner capacity to act as co-creators of, of the new world. And do those still exist today? They do. They do. Many of them do exist. But but we today we have more the impression that they are uh, around lifelong learning uh, rather than uh, developing these capacities. But I should answer your question there if they exist in other parts of the world. And there is an interesting twist there. I show you a copy of the book. This is the Nordic Secret. Do, do you recognize the, the woman up in the corner there? No. It's a black American woman and this is her mugshot. It's Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. Who, who refused to give up her seat on, uh, on the bus in Alabama. And the reason and you could ask, well, what is Rosa Parks doing on a, on a cover of the Nordic Secret, that together with the German philosophers Goethe and Schiller? Well, she has said in many interviews that what gave her the inner compass and the strength to actually remain seated on the bus, even if she knew that the law of the land said that she should give it up to, to that white guy, was the fact that she had participated in one of, the, in one of these developmental centers not in Scandinavia, but in the US. Because there were an American guy called Miles Horton, who in the 20s spent a year in Denmark learning this concept, and then going back to the US and starting four folk high schools, which is this concept is called in the US, of which the Highlander folk school in Tennessee is the most uh, notable one where Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, and a lot of people in the, in the civil rights movement participated. And they actually paid, played these four schools in, in the US, played such an important role that uh, President Obama, at the end of his presidency, when he had the four heads of states of the Scandinavian countries, or the Nordic countries, at a state visit, said something along the line, and this is still available on, on YouTube, this speech, 
that you Scandinavian countries have given a lot of gifts to the world, and I don't know if there was uh, dynamite and the IKEA or whatever, but <laughs> but a forgotten gift, and perhaps the most important, is the concept of the folk high schools. Because if it hadn't been for that originally Danish concept and that that had come to the US, I would probably not be standing here in front of you as the first black American president. So that's quite strong. 